we also have a Tenure Tiger Brain Training as a program that we offer um, here in Richmond. So I'll tell you a little bit more about myself. I've got a, a slide for that. Um, first, what we want to kind of accomplish today, um, but think we hear is um, I guess understanding of the importance of limit setting if you have uh, neglect or trauma or caregiver change, how uh, this impacts their brain development, and then how this is going to look like in a relationship with any kind of an authority figure, and then um, go away with at least three strategies to help reduce defiance and improve cooperation and following directions, setting, accepting limits, things that these um, folks kind of struggle with. Uh, and I know that's what people want a lot of times. The, the science is really good. It's helpful. It gives us an insight. However, what do we do in the moment? And so I want to be able to give you guys some strategies, some real um, tools you can use when you leave today, and then also resources to go get more to help you. So I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist and a registered play therapist. Like I said, I own Heart and Mind. Uh, we're here in Richmond. We provide outpatient therapy. I have a fabulous team of folks. And we also have a uh, Tenure Tiger Brain Training, which kind of reaches some areas that the therapy can. Uh, I also have a book called Toby the Tiger Tamer. Um, and tiger Taming came out of play therapy, and the book came from that. Um, and so it's just kind of grown from there. And just so you know, I did become a therapist a little bit later in life. I promised my husband it was my last career. Um, and that, well, and I, it happened because of becoming an adoptive parent. And when I was reading books to become an adoptive parent, because I knew it was going to be different than parenting my boys that I had from birth, that um, I got really just fascinated with the science, actually, of the impact of trauma and neglect on brain development. Um, and literally was kind of looking for a therapist before I even had my daughter. And so, uh, but what I found was that a lot of the therapists and other services that I came across actually had less knowledge of what had kind of happened probably with the child I was going to be adopting than, than uh, I did just from reading books. And that was a little scary to me that this is a population that has a lot of needs and it seemed like there weren't as many people out there. Um, and so I ended up, you know, deciding to want to have some hands on with healing for these folks. And so went in the therapy direction and play therapy just kind of came along naturally because uh, it's fun and playful and it helps kids to uh, describe things and, and address things in a way that talking it just doesn't, isn't going to reach. So when we use play therapy a lot in our work in a lot of different ways. All right, so first I want to talk about the importance of limit setting. And the reason that I want to bring this up is because what I have seen a lot is parents kind of going one direction or another. They become uh, um, very rigid and setting a lot of limits and a lot of high expectations and really getting uh, burnt out because this child's having difficulty with following them. Or they go the other way and they get tired of fighting a child that's constantly fighting them and they completely give up and throw their hands up and stop uh, trying to parent, stop trying to set limits. And so I want to talk about the importance of limit setting and so that we have an understanding that it is needed and it is necessary um, in a lot of ways that we normally would need it for parenting. But for these kiddos, there's even some other issues, especially for kiddos that have experienced uh, neglect. So if a child has been left on their own, um, left in a crib, left to not uh, interact with the world, they've already been left without limits and boundaries. And so if we completely throw our hands up and stop trying to help them, then we're kind of mimicking that. So we want to create that sense of safety and security. If you are you know, walking along a path on the edge of a mountainside, you want to know where the edge is. It is very dangerous to not know where the line is. And so we want to provide that safety and security uh, sense of feeling for them, um, not just their physical safety, but then also 
their world view because if they don't think that the world is a safe place, which they likely don't because of their history, then they're not going to be developing in other ways because their body is going to be so focused on survival. And we want them to have a sense that even if something bad were to happen here, is somebody who is competent and can help me. Um, and that goes into the next, you know, the trust area. It builds trust that you are competent, that you know what you're doing. These kids often come out of their early experiences not trusting adults in general, not just the parent, but just adults in general. We look like incompetent fools because of what happened to them early on in their life. We didn't take care of them. And so even if you are a parent of the year and you're doing it all right, it doesn't matter because their view might be that adults are incompetent. And so if we continue to set limits and be consistent and have good boundaries, then they're going to develop that trust and see that, oh, okay, it's not all adults. It might have just been those adults. Aship is a uh, former foster child, and he's now a motivational speaker. And I use a lot of his videos in my trainings because he's, he's fabulous. And I feel like it's, you know, coming from the horse's mouth, so to speak. Now, in his, his videos now, because he's really, um, he's really focusing on teenagers, so he does speak and use the word teen or teens, but it's really applicable to parenting all children, and so, you know, don't disregard the fact that he's talking about teenagers, because he really is talking about parenting in general. There's some guy around sort of pushes down that lap safety bar, secures the lap safety bar. Now, if you're like me, what's the very first thing you do? You grab that bar, you push it, you prod it, you wiggle it, you test it. Now, think about it. I mean, do you push and prod and test and wiggle that bar hoping that it will give, hoping that it will fail, leading to your inevitable death if you splat on the pavement? Of course not. You push it and you prod it and you test it, hoping, confirming, it will hold. Listen to me. That teen in your life is doing the exact same thing. They are pushing you and prodding you and testing you, hoping, confirming you will hold. I mean, at a time in their life when so many things are uncertain, they need to know that you are certain. At a time in their life when so many things are unstable, they need to know that you are stable. And at a time in their life when so many things are erratic, they need to know that you are consistent. But the news, if the teen in your life pushes you, doesn't mean you're a bad person or an imbecile or doing it all wrong or messing things up or saying the wrong things. It simply means you're dealing with a teenager. He said it beautifully. I love the, the roller coaster analogy. Um, they are pushing and prodding to for their own safety. And so they don't need a lap belt that's going to suffocate them um, because they need to have room to wiggle and grow, but they also don't need a, a lap belt that's going to give way and not hold. Uh, so it's a great um, balance between what they need and what works for them. So um, this is from a, um, an article uh, from the UK, but I love the, the message of it about how, you know, most of us were just programmed to kind of deal with frightening things for a short period of time, and then we get relief. You go to a horror movie, and then you come away laughing with your friends and family. Um, you, you know, have a, a car run a red light in front of you, you know, you, we gasp, and we slam on the brakes, and then we go. So our body is able to recover and repair itself from those quick, you know, frightening things that happen. Um, but like she says, you know, in, in the UK, about a hundred and a half, you know, I'm sorry, a million and a half children uh, who are abused and neglected every year are actually being frightened chronically, you know, without rest or relief. And the consequences disturb behaviors and violence. So if the maltreatment of children is altering their developmental pathways, which it is, then we are not dealing with children who are morally flawed. So
So often as adults and parents, we're kind of looking through this lens of their behavior and what it would mean, you know, at an older age or as an adult. So if they hit someone, oh my gosh, they're going to go to jail. Um, you know, if they kick a cat, oh my gosh, they're going to be a serial killer. There, we read so much into what does that behavior mean, and we miss what's going on actually in the moment, and we miss how is their history impacting what they're doing right now. So, you know, these kids are not morally flawed. They're scared. They are chronically frightened. And so if you can really change your lens of viewing them this way, it will help you to not feel like you have to fix everything uh, in five minutes or you have to be the perfect parent and be on task on uh, perfect behavior yourself all the time or you're risking their whole entire values and moral system. You know, this is a journey. And so keep that in mind uh, as you're working with these kids or raising these children. All right, so let's go over a little bit of the impact on the brain functioning. So um, I'm not gonna get too um, brainy on you. Um, the autonomic nervous system, that's the ANS, so that's really impacted the way that our nervous system works. So PV stands for polyvagal theory. It's Dr. Stephen Porges. And you know, his research, he's, he studied the autonomic nervous system and the, the uh, vagal system in our body for you know, 20, 30 years, somewhere in that range, and has shown us really kind of how our nervous system works. And when you have, and I have other trainings on the polyvagal theory, so I'm not gonna go into that in depth but when um, the way that i describe it is the tiger and the owl so our survival system part of our brain is the tiger and it's kind of like a radar and it's watching for danger and it's looking out to see what's going to happen next and it's also categorizing and filing things that have happened in the past so that you can be warned and prepared for the next time it happens it's all it's emotional it's um, reactive and um, it's not thinking. You know, tiger is all action. The owl is our thinking brain. That's our logic, it's our reason, it's our words. Um, so when you were saying use your words, we're talking to the owl. The problem is sometimes you don't, there's no owl present because when the tiger wakes up, the owl flies away. And so we have to address what's going on with the tiger in order for it to calm down so that the owl returns and then a child can use their words better and they can understand our words better. And physiologically, there is a change in our nervous system that they are tuning out human voice when they're in survival mode. So when your kids are tuning you out, they're literally tuning you out. Your nervous system is wired to do that. Um, control. So obviously control for kiddos that have had um, like Josh you know, mentioned when their worlds have been very erratic and a lot of change and inconsistency control is going to feel better to them and that's they you know are going to feel safer with that control I had a, um, a seven-year-old I was working with and he and um, he didn't say this to me he said this to his mother and when they were talking about school and rules at school and why you have rules and things like that, because he was getting in trouble at school. And he said to her, I don't follow your rules. I don't follow the school's rules. I follow my rules because my rules keep me safe. So in his mind, he was the only one capable. And that's why he was trying to exert control over everything and run everything because his tiger had you know, kind of given him the message that you need to be running everything to stay safe. Uh, trust, obviously we talked about that. There's a lack of trust often with adults or caregivers. Uh, Self-reliance, again, they feel like they have to depend on themselves. Um, I love this term. It comes from one of the articles that I, I quote in here, brain aligned discipline. I love that. Um, this discipline that is aligned with what's going on in the brain and where they're at developmentally, not because they're five, they should act like this, because in that moment, they may actually be two. And so we need to align our discipline with where their brain is at right now. So if they are behaving like a four-year-old, and I'm not talking about shaming them and say, you need to grow up at your age, 
I'm talking about the way that you respond and the, the intervention kind of that you give them or the strategy that you use is aimed at their age um, and their age in the moment, their emotional social age, not their chronological age. Okay, so we all know this one. No. Why is no, and this is for all kids a lot of time. I had a two-year-old grandson who's going through this now. This is not fun. He doesn't like it. Why is no such a trigger? And why for these kiddos with these histories, why is it often worse? Um, and well, why is their reaction so much bigger than a typical child or adult child without their history? Um, no can be a lot of things. It can be part of that control factor. So you're not letting me be in control, so you're taking away my ability to stay safe. If, just like that seven-year-old said, if I feel like my rules are the only rules that keep me safe, and you're changing up these rules, you're taking them away, you're jeopardizing my safety. That's how their brain is, is registering that. Um, I've also seen no be huge with, uh, because of the grief and loss factor. These kids have often lost a lot, lost family, lost homes, lost friends, lost pets, lost clothes, lost toys, lost culture, lost language. There's a lot of things they may have lost. And when you're saying no, that's another loss to them. And it touches on that kind of mountain of other losses in their history. It's like the pile of laundry that just keeps getting bigger. And so a lot of times to you, something that's a small no might be a big one. So this is my challenge. If you can say yes, say yes. And I am not saying give in and let them do whatever they want to do. That is certainly not. Remember my very first slide, limit setting and boundaries are important. But it's also about how you say it. So if they can't do one thing, instead of saying, no, don't do that, can you tell them what they can do instead? You can give them permission to do one thing instead of another. If they can't play at Susie's house because Susie's not home, can you say, we can play outside or let's call Jenny and see if she can play? Um, you know, or you can't hit your brother, but you can uh, pound on the couch. Um, you know, giving them permission to do something instead is going to help them learn how to manage those big feelings. Um, so it takes some, some effort, takes some creativity. Um, but if you find that you can cut down the amount of struggles that you have with these kiddos by just simply finding different ways to get things done without just simply giving in and letting them do whatever they want to do, because that's not good either. Um, but this is a little bit more about the no, kind of stirring that tiger grief and loss, that defiance control feels better. You know, that self-reliance, they have that lack of trust in adults, and they just don't have coping skills sometimes to manage those big feelings. This is a really good quote. If I am not in control, bad things happen. When bad things are happening around me, the only way I can survive is by being in control. The tiger is pretty much taken over. It's not listening to the owl anymore. It doesn't care about logic, doesn't care about reason, doesn't care about what happened last time they did this, uh, whatever their punishment was before. It's not going to be registering. Uh, the other animal I use is the hippo. The hippo is our memory. The hippo is under the water and that tiger is fully awake. So whatever you've done for teach, trying to teach them in the past or whatever their punishment's been in the past, you ain't going to remember it in that moment because survival is completely in control. So again, brain-aligned discipline, knowing what's going on in their brain is going to help us to uh, react and to help them through that moment so they can improve their coping and, and can improve how they're handling something. So again, these kiddos, oftentimes we get into this a constant power struggle. There's a kind of a, and the parents kind of will result in either clamping down and trying to exert their own control more, or they kind of give up. So we've got our tug of war going on here. I'm sure many of you can kind of relate to this. 
we don't probably look as cute as these puppies do when we're pulling on that rope, but it's not fun. And there's usually no winner. So giving up would be kind of dropping the rope and letting the kid have the rope. Or we just keep digging in and pulling harder. We want to do neither one of those things. We want to eliminate the rope. Interesting concept. So how can you gain cooperation without pulling them, without pushing them? And fear is often, again, fears which is driving them holding onto that rope. They literally oftentimes they're biologically being driven that if, if I let go of this rope, I'm going to die. So we want to take fear out in order to be able to move forward. And if we're getting angry, if we're pulling harder, if we're insisting more, if we're putting more expectations, then we're scaring them. Or if we're dropping the rope and we're walking away and we're leaving them completely on their own to deal with this, then they are still just as lost. Because even though they may feel or are driven to be in control and manage, they don't have the ability, they don't have the skills, and biologically they are wired to regulate with an adult um, until they get a lot older. And so if we're abandoning them in their moment of distress, and especially if they experience neglect, we're just kind of recreating that same scenario. So we want to take the fear out. We want to figure out how do we work beside them? How do we collaborate to get to the top? Um, so just a, a quick example with my daughter, she had a big fear of, um, of asking like strangers questions, approaching uh, strangers. And so if we're like eating in a fast food restaurant and she needed ketchup and you have to go, you know, up to the, to the counter to ask for ketchup, she wouldn't do it. So in the beginning, you know, we're, we're being understanding caring. And you got to remember when my daughter was this age, I was not a therapist yet. So I was just a parent. But as I got more learning and more training and experience, and I look back on these memories, I, I can understand now kind of why something didn't work. And there were lots of things that didn't work. And why some things did work. So let's say, uh, like I said, she, she wanted ketchup. So at first in the beginning, we would go get the ketchup for her. You know, we're loving parents. We know she's a little scared. It's all new to her, new language for her and everything. And so, um, so we get the ketchup for her. And then after a while, we kind of decided, all right, you know, she needs to kind of, you know, get over this fear a little bit. We've got to push her. And so we would say, no, you know, if you want ketchup, you know, you can go get ketchup. Just, you know, ask for ketchup. We try and help her, you know, practice what she needed to ask and things. And she just, she just go without it. So we're like, okay, fine, go without it. Thinking, you know, long enough, she decides she wants ketchup, she'll go get it. But as you'll see, with these kiddos, sometimes <laughs> that's not going to work. Um, the fear is just too great, and they can't do it by themselves sometimes. And so I was like, well, we're not really getting anywhere because, you know, if we do it for her, she's not getting over the fear. If we, if we leave her to do it on her own, she's not doing it. So it's not, we're not accomplishing anything. And so finally I said, okay, I'll get you the ketchup, but you have to come with me. And so we walked up there, I asked for the ketchup, and when they brought the ketchup, she actually put her hand out and took it and said, thank you. And we come back. And, and the next time she went out with herself. Um, same thing was in the bathroom. When we first, she first got here, she was fed when she was adopted and, um, and she would not go to a public bathroom by herself. I had to literally go in the stall with her in order for her to go to the bathroom. Again, not a big deal. We'll help her out, take some time, get better, but it wasn't getting better. So, you know, of course you don't want to say, well, you need to go by yourself because then of course she's going to hold it and she's not going to go, which is not healthy. Um, going to end up causing an accident, things like that. So again, kind of stuck in that middle place. So I said, okay, what else can we do? So the next time we end up going to the bathroom, I um, you know, had her go in the stall and I stood outside of it, put my hand on the top of the door and stuck my foot underneath the door. And I kind of danced my foot around being silly and you know, making sounds, knocking and waving my fingers and wiggling them and being kind of funny um, so that she obviously could see me, could hear me. She knew I was there, but I wasn't in the stall with her. 
And then we went to, I could go in the stall next to hers because she could always look under and see my feet if she needed to. And then eventually, you know, she's going on her own. And, you know, she's 19 now driving and obviously going to the bathroom on her own. So that's just an example of, so how can we find a good middle ground where we're not pulling them to go, you know, make them do it or pushing them to do it, um, or we're just dropping the situation and, and thinking that eventually they'll end up doing it. How can you find some middle ground where you're kind of taking the fear out that you're helping them, you're walking beside them, but you're not leaving them on their own or you're not pushing them so hard. That's how you get rid of the rope because you're walking in and the rope is naturally going to drop. So um, I choose to view this as a fist bump, <laughs> um, but I'm sure what it looks like more is kind of aggression. And so I know that oftentimes we're dealing with uh, meltdowns or we're dealing with kind of those tigers that are completely awake and out of control. So let's talk more about kind of the meltdown and when they're kind of out of it. Obviously, when my daughter wanted ketchup, she wasn't kind of having a meltdown over the ketchup. It was just uh, a fear that was hard for her to overcome, but she certainly wasn't in kind of a meltdown mode. All right, so now we're gonna kind of move into our strategies, the fun part that I know folks are kind of waiting for. It's like, okay, I get this, I've learned that, I, you know, I already read that book. So what do I do? How, what are some things that work? Um, so one of the things to just keep in mind is that some of these strategies are gonna work when your child is calm enough to hear them. So again, when the owl is present, they can hear you and they can kind of logic and reason. And um, so some of these are not going to be things that you're going to do in a full down, full blown meltdown, but some of them are going to be things that you're going to be able to apply to help those meltdowns get less intense and less frequent and eventually get better because biologically they will be able to, their coping internally will get improved. So, you know, again, these are going to be kind of different instances for different situations. So uh, I'm going to go through each of these in general, but ACT is um, from play therapy. We use it in play therapy, or if you're doing filial therapy, you're teaching a parent these skills. This is one skill that my parents could often use at home as well. Um, it's not something that has to be, it's not specific to play therapy. You can certainly take this and use it at home. The Whole Brain Child is a book, and we'll talk about that, but um, it has great information on the brain, what's going on with the child's brain, the parent's brain, but then they also give you actual strategies, and it doesn't even have to be children from hard places. I've given this book as baby shower gifts all the time for everybody because it is just really, really helpful um, in understanding your child and how to help them become emotionally intelligent. And they will be more successful if you deal with their emotional intelligence than anything else. Um, brain aligned discipline, uh, I got great natural consequences that consequence options that teach from their article. And, um, and then tiger taming drills, which is um, what I um, have kind of come up with from using kind of the tiger and the owl. All right, so ACT first. A stands for acknowledge the feeling or the desire. B is communicate the limit. And T is target alternatives. So acknowledging their feeling or their desire is speaking to their tiger first. It's gonna help them to feel heard. It's gonna help them to see that you understand. Um, doesn't mean that they can do it. It just means that you get it. Um, communicating the limit, just giving them their you know, letting them know that boundary. It's telling them where that line is on that path at the side of the mountain. Here's the line. Um, and then you're giving them alternatives. So here's our yes part. This is what you can do instead. Um, so what it might look like is, oh, I know you really want to throw that doll. However, dolls are not for throwing. You may throw a ball or you may squeeze the, the doll really tight. Um, so, you know, you're acknowledging their feeling of what or the desire of what they want to do. You're letting them know what they can't do, but then you're also telling them now what are some 
some close alternatives because it does need to kind of match what's going on. Um, you know, a lot of times, you know, we say, well, do you want to punch a punching bag? But if they're not actually wanting to punch right now, that's really not going to help. Um, and so the alternatives need to be related sort of to what's going on in the moment. Uh, and again, sometimes there's safety involved. You might have to do something quickly. This is certainly is not going to work if they're, you know, walking off the edge of a, a deck or something, you're going to grab them. Um, but afterwards, you say, oh, I know you were really curious about what was going on in the backyard, but we can't jump off this side. It's too high. How about we go down the stairs over here? So you can, you know, keep them safe, obviously, first, and then um, have this conversation with them to help them know and what you're doing. And again, you're being that consistent. You're that um, safety bar on the roller coaster by providing that safety and then you're doing the teaching afterwards. So the Whole Brain Child and No Drama Discipline, they're two different books that are both by um, Dan Siegel and Tina Payne Bryson. Um, Dan Siegel's a child psychiatrist and researcher and uh, Tina Payne Bryson is a therapist and so they got together on these books, which have been fabulous because um, people can kind of bring in the research and the science and Tina can put it into language that works for parents. And so, you know, they kind of collaborated together to take that information and help parents. And their books have a lot of different strategies. I'm only pulling one of them out for this uh, presentation, but it's the connect and redirect, which is very similar to kind of like ACT where you are going to connect to them first on that. You're going to connect to the tiger. You're going to connect to the emotion. You're going to connect to their feeling or their desire of what's going on in the moment. And then you're going to redirect them. Um, because if you don't connect first, a lot of times we start with the redirection. Well, the redirection is talking to the owl. The owl is not present right now. They're, they're emotional. So you want to speak to that tiger first, get the tiger calmed down, and then you can speak to the, the owl. It's like, you know, speaking Swahili, they're not going to understand you. All right, so natural consequences that teach. And I added in the uh, when the owl is back. So again, these are things that need to happen when everybody's calm after the fact. If a child walks in because they got, and they're all upset after school, they got in trouble at school, and they're in a bad place, um, now is the time to calm down, and then once we're calm, then we can try to teach what to do in that situation next time, or you know, give a consequence. So um, some of the quotes from, from her article, like preventative systems are taught as procedures and routines. So, and they're collaborative and filled with choice. Their purpose is to create a sustainable behavioral change, not just compliance or obedience for a short period of time. And this is really important because that's what the, the point of tiger taming drills is, is we are looking at the long term of this child being able to manage their feelings, being able to make appropriate choices, for what to do to help them, that's a healthy choice, it's not going to hurt anybody. Um, it's kind of the same, and the reason I call it tiger taming drills is because, and we'll talk about them specifically, but it's the same reason we have fire drills, the same reason that I'm sure in the... Um, Tornado Alley, you know, they have their drills for the tornadoes. Uh, it's why schools have plans in place, you know, for active shooters. You know, when you have procedures and you have routines and you practice them, then it, the, the whole hope and goal is, is that when there is an actual emergency, that things are going to go well. You know, if a child is drowning, you're not going to try to teach them to swim while they're drowning. You save them. You calm them down, you help them feel better, and then you enroll them in swimming lessons. Um, so, you know, your preventative systems are routines and procedures, and we're, but we need to do them when the child is calm, not in that heavy emotional moment. Um, so some of the examples that she gives of some natural consequences that actually help teach are like, let's say a child gets in trouble because they were calling um, someone names or you heard them calling their you know, sibling a name. Um, you can have them create a book of positive affirmations about the person that they call a name. Um, you know, when we force a child to just say, I'm sorry, all we're doing is forcing them to, to 
it, you know, Pavlov's dog, when the bell rings, I say, I'm sorry. Um, it's not actually helping them to gain empathy. It's simply just teaching them to say you know, particular words. Um, so we want to match what happened to actually gain some empathy. So if they, you know, called their sibling a bad name, you know, you could have them, and they don't have to do a whole book, you know, again, age appropriate. They could just write on a sticky note, something you like about their sibling and have them take it to them uh, or leave it on their door or something like that. Um, you know, something that matches. If there's some type of minor aggression towards somebody, then have them perform an act of kindness or service. If they hit their brother and their brother's job is to take the trash out, well, guess what? You get to take your brother's trash out for your brother tomorrow. Um, you know, if they use inappropriate language, this works really well for me and um, with the play therapy, you know, I don't tell kids that they can't curse, but we talk about when is that appropriate? When should you use it? What's going to happen if you use it? Uh, you know, if you stub your toe in the middle of the woods playing with your friends and you say curse words, there's probably nothing bad going to happen. You know, but if you say that up in the middle of church, you're probably going to get in a lot of trouble. Um, and so, yes, as parents, you might want to say this is a bad word. We don't use this. And that's fine. You don't we use it in your home. We don't use it in school. Um, but it's more about um, helping them. Instead of just saying no, you're letting them know why or when or where. And, and that makes it more understandable. And it's going to stick with them a whole lot longer. All right, so getting to the tiger teaming drills. All right, so again, it's kind of the same concept of, of fire, fire drills. Schools don't wait until there's an actual fire to practice this. Again, we don't wait till the child's drowning to teach them to swim. If you take five minutes a couple of times a week for a kid who's having really odd of meltdowns or aggression or really just regulation problems, then you're gonna help them not only learn what to do or how to do it, you're also gonna be showing them. Um, and you're gonna be doing it when the owl is present, when the hippo is present, because if you don't do it then, they're not gonna remember it. That's the same reason that police and um, law enforcement and the military do drills. That's why they're, they're training every, you know, for police officers, you know, they're going to the, to the range every year to practice shooting. They're not waiting until the bad guy is in front of them with a gun. They're, they're practicing to be ready. And so the same reason that, again, that we do the fire drills in schools. So a tiger teaming drill, some of the, the points that I make with kids is when we're trying to figure out what helps your tiger, when we're trying to figure out what works to help you to calm down and bring that owl back, there's only three rules, three things. You can't hurt yourself. You can't hurt any other living thing. And you can't destroy something that was not meant to be destroyed. And the reason that it said they are not that you can't destroy things is because I actually have things that they can destroy. Um, it is actually helpful to have things that are okay, paper for them to rip up. Um, I had one kid that needed the, and, and, and I'm not an OT, so I kind of know enough to be dangerous. I think it might be proprioceptive input that he um, needed to, he liked to break um, stuff in his hand and it had to be something kind of hard because he needed to kind of use his muscles to do that. That's why I think it's proprioceptive. Um, but um, so we actually, they had a drawer in their house that they would throw like the extra silverware from fast food restaurants, that plastic silverware and like the, in the, in the, the plastic um, paper. And so they, we made that drawer accessible for him. When he would get angry, he could go grab one out and break you know, one of those pieces of free plastic silverware they've gotten into a fast food place. So it, it doesn't hurt to have things if, if that's what their body needs in that moment. If they like to throw things, have a box with, you know, soft stuffed animals, soft balls or something like that, that are things that they can throw that aren't really going to hurt um, anything or break anything. Or if you need to have a place they can throw it at because you don't want them to knock lamps over or whatever, you know, have a designated wall or, or the sofa or something that they do. And then, because that's why, like I said, the tiger, everybody's tiger is unique. You got to find out who works for their tiger. Um, 
and letting them know we have to practice because they're going to think you're, it's ridiculous. They're like, why are we doing this? This is stupid. I'm not mad right now. This is stupid. Um, again, we're practicing it when they're calm so that they can hopefully remember it and put it into place so that it'll stick with them enough when the tiger wakes up that they can do it. Um, and you can use these examples like fire drills. I use examples like it's like it's when we're learning something new, you know, if you're going to start playing the guitar, you're not going to wait till the night of the concert to pick up the guitar and start practicing, right? So why wait until they're having a meltdown to start trying to teach them what to do in their meltdown? Not going to happen. Got to practice when that hippo is present or they're not going to remember it later. Um, we need to speak kind of the tiger's language, not the owl's. So you might not want them to throw something, but if that's what they constantly do when they're upset, would you rather have a narrow pathway of things that they can throw or what they can throw it at um, that's not going to hurt anything? And then eventually their body is going to get better and they're not going to need to throw. So a lot of people think, oh, well, aren't you teaching them aggression? Aren't we teaching them it's bad to do this? No, what we're actually doing is allowing their body to learn what helps it to calm down. Um, you know, my daughter, when she first came home, the meltdowns were, you know, in, and I really believe she was regressing kind of back to infancy, but she would fall down to the ground, kick and flail, and so she didn't get aggressive towards somebody in specifically, but if anything was in her way, it was going to get hit, it was going to get kicked, it was going to get knocked. Um, and so and that's including herself. I mean, she could have hurt herself, you know, by just flailing and kicking. Um, and so, and again, not a therapist at the time, simply a parent, just trying to figure this out. Um, very different than, you know, my kids that I've had by birth. And so eventually I was kind of using the, the um, volume of her screams to know if I was doing the right thing or the wrong thing. So if she stopped screaming, I was doing the right thing. If the screaming got louder, I was doing the wrong thing. So, of course, you know, when they're doing that, you think, oh, well, let me pick them up. Let me try to hold them or, you know, let me restrain them so they're not hurting themselves or going to break something. Um, of course, touching, you know, tigers reading that is danger. Nope, don't touch me. Um, so we're screaming louder. Okay, don't touch her. Um, okay, maybe she wants to be alone. Maybe the, my presence is really bothering her. So let me leave the room. Nope, leave the room, screaming louder. So eventually I found that staying probably about two or three feet away and kind of usually being lower down, like sitting on the floor or something. Um, so I'm out of kick and hit range, but I am um, close enough that she knows that I'm there. And then I was talking to myself and I now know looking back that I was really just keeping myself regulated. What I was saying really wasn't having any impact on her. Um, but I was helping myself to stay calm. And I was just saying things like, you know, oh, when your brothers were little, I didn't would get upset, I would hold them. It makes me so sad, I can't hold you. Um, when you're upset, I would really like, you know, to help you to feel better. Um, and really, I'm basically just saying, oh, woe is me. <laughs> I can't make you feel better. I'm your mom and that's my job. I'm supposed to do that and I'm failing here. Um, and so I was really dealing kind of with my own issues of, she has lost it and I can't fix this. So um, eventually what would happen is she would calm down and then we kind of got into this routine where afterwards we would go snuggle for a little while, maybe turn the TV on, just kind of veg a little bit and uh, or get the, you know, a book and just kind of flip through the book or something like that um, and kind of connect as she calmed down. Um, now, of course, I wasn't doing tiger taming girls at the time, so I wasn't going back and talking about what happened. But eventually, these meltdowns just got shorter in intensity, shorter in time. So they started out being probably 30 minutes when she was losing it. Um, and just shorter and shorter. Eventually, it got to where I could just see it in her face. You know, you could just see that she kind of, you know, went. Um, and then um, eventually, um, you know, they were gone. And so it, and it didn't take as long as you might think. It feels like it in the moment. I mean, a kid having a meltdown for 30 minutes, that's, that's a long time. And that's hard. Um, so, you know, it, and, and again, I was kind of lucky that 
I think that the way that she was regressing, she was going back so far, she wasn't getting aggressive. She was really kind of in that freeze mode and melting down. So, um, you know, when they're being aggressive, that is a whole other ball game, and you have to do what you need to do to keep them safe from themselves uh, until they can calm down. But if they're not hurting themselves or someone else, you can be there to support them and let them know they're not alone, and you can maintain your own regulation to kind of help them out. Um, also, part of this would be when you're doing the, the I think I kind of got off talking about when they're actually melting down, but we're doing these drills, of course, when they're calm. Um, you know, we're letting them know we want to practice it when we're calm so that maybe we can help to kind of remember what to do. We can kind of file it away. And um, when you notice that they have a meltdown sometime and they actually do pick up that pillow they're supposed to and, and toss it at the, at the couch instead of, you know, picking up something else they're not supposed to throw. Again, later when they're calmed down, maybe your next tiger taming drill session, say, wow, I really, I noticed that you picked up the pillow and threw it. That was fabulous. Um, you know, sounds like that, you know, your, the drills are helping you to remember what to do. So kind of celebrating those small successes and small steps, not going to go away overnight. This is a progress, you know, this is, you know, this is thousands and thousands of times that as a, a small child that they were probably not tended to, and they were not shown how to calm down, they weren't regulated by an adult, um, and they don't, their system just doesn't know how to do it on its own yet. They are still really relying on us to calm down. And so the more you can help them to see that and empower that they can tame this tiger, that they have the power to do this, they're going to feel more empowered and not feel out of control. Because that's what happens when they, they melt down is they are out of control. And that doesn't feel good for them either. So, um, these are just some links for the um, articles and things that I have in the PowerPoint. Uh, um, so if anybody just you know wants to read more about those or get more in-depth information or get those books, those are great. The link for that there. Here are some of the books that I recommend to folks that in these lines. Um, if you want to learn more about what happens in the brain, uh, The Boy Who Was Raised as a Dog by uh, Dr. Bruce Perry is fabulous. All of my therapists have to read this. Uh, no Drama Discipline, of course, The Whole Brain Child we talked about. Um, Heather Ford's Beyond Consequences, Logic and Control is another really good one. And I'm going to end with Mr. Joshua because he said that, well, plus a quote there is from Heather Forbes, that love recognizes that the behavior of a child does not determine the parent's effectiveness. Welcome to Mr. Andrews. I had Mr. Andrews' class during the peak of my, shall we say, squirrely years in high school. I was disruptive. I was annoying. I was a nuisance. I was a distraction. I was a class clown. I was that kid every teacher feared having in their class. And yet, even though I was all that, Mr. Andrews was a unflappable force of encouragement. Now, I'm not saying he didn't hold the line with me. I'm saying while he held the line, he also sort of showed me that another line was available. So he took what most adults, understandably, saw as an annoyance, and he helped me develop it into an asset. He looked past the superficial layer of fear and hurt that was acting out, and he saw something underneath. He saw me. Mr. Andrews was a patient and dedicated locksmith that helped me unlock my potential. Now, here's the whole reason I'm telling you about Mr. Andrews. I first had his class in 1997. I did not thank Mr. Andrews until 2010. That's 13 years later. Oftentimes, one of the most difficult things about being a parent, a teacher, or a caring adult is this nagging fear that maybe you're not making a difference. Listen to me. You have no idea the impact you are making right now. All right. I mean, think back to when you were a kid, right? About sort of how clueless you and I were to the amazing adults around us who gave and gave and then gave some more, right? Our brains as kids didn't yet have the perspective or the life experience, right? We didn't have the eyes to see 
what these amazing adults were giving to us, really a gift. And yet, years later, right, when you and I think back about the people that mattered, those catalytic moments, there are names that float to the top of our mind, like Mr. Andrews. So I say this all to you to say this, you've got to have hope. Right now, it might be your 1997. I want you to trust that your 2010 is for company. So if anybody has, you know, questions or comments, um, feel free to reach out. I do have my phone on there, but I'll be honest with you, I'm really bad about phone management and seeing clients and all of that. Email is really the best way to reach me or on Facebook. I don't have them listed on here, but we are on Facebook. I think we're, I think we're HeartMind RVA um, um, on Facebook and um, websites, all of that. So, but if you search for us, you'll find us. Um, but I really appreciate everybody's time. I appreciate Newfound families and their commitment to helping these families. We have a very common goal and a very common passion here. So I appreciate again, kind of everyone's time and energy. Um, I, I left this to be able to have time. So if anybody um, has questions or anything like that, feel free to reach out and, um, Again, I appreciate everybody's time and I hope everybody has a fabulous Memorial Day weekend.